YouTube. Welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. I hope you are all staying warm out there. Uh, today is January 14th. Yep, I got that right. And um, wow, we're setting all sorts of uh, high temperatures today here in the, uh, the outer exurbs of Denver, Colorado. What do we got here? We've got... Um, we're three degrees higher than they predicted today, so uh, uh, we're sitting at five. <laughs> it's supposed to be a high of two today um, in Colorado, uh, from where I am broadcasting, and uh, we're actually, we've hit five. Now, tomorrow is supposed to be the coldest day. We have a high of one and an 80% chance of some snow. So, um, wow, how exciting is that? Anyway, I hope all of you out there are staying warm you're staying safe um it's just it's brutal weather in many parts of the country right now so i i pray that you're all doing well um so today's video i thought i'd do some um make some videos this this long three-day weekend to kind of catch up on some things and this video is all about brand new military history i haven't made a casemate video in a few months it's been about three months um in the meantime i've just gotten a slew of new books, uh, military history of a variety of topics and times and wars. And, um, you know, I have to share them with you because they are just, uh, they're just the best. If you are a military history fan, military history reader, and, uh, just, you watch documentaries, you love all things military history. Uh, you need to come here to the history shelf because, Casemate is always in my rotation. <laughs> um, all right, we've got a lot, and I probably will need to make a second video. I might save that for a couple weeks from now, but I'm going to try to get it all recorded for you guys. But let's dive right in. All right, so the first book I've got here is uh, called Forgotten War, The British Empire uh, and Commonwealth's Epic Struggle Against Imperial Japan, 1941 to 1945, by Brian E. Walter. And this is a casemate title, as you can tell from their logo right there. So I'll try to avoid the glare for you as I read a little bit about this. Um, the monumental struggle fought against Imperial Japan in the Asia Pacific theater during World War II is primarily viewed as an American affair. Um, while the U.S. did play a dominant role, the British and Commonwealth forces also made major contributions on land, at sea, and in the air, eventually involving over a million men and vast armadas of ships and aircraft. It was a difficult and often desperate conflict fought against a skilled and ruthless enemy that initially saw the British suffer the, w the worst series of defeats ever to befall their armed forces. Still, the British persevered as they do, um, and slowly turned the tables on their Japanese antagonists, fighting over an immense area that stretched from India in the west to the Solomon Islands in the east and Australia in the south to the waters off Japan in the north, British and Commonwealth forces eventually scored a string of stirring victories that avenged their earlier defeats and helped facilitate the demise of the Japanese Empire. So, um, Definitely a more a British focused history for the Asian Pacific um, theater of war. You know, I've got tons of books behind me um, on, uh, you know, U.S. forces in that theater. So this is a welcome addition um, to reading about just how the British kind of um, what they were doing at the same time. So British, uh, Brian Walter is the author, Brian E. Walter. Um, so these books, these are available right now. These came out uh, last year, at the end of last year. Um, actually, this one's very new, came out on uh, December 31st, 2023. So I wanted to get that, uh, put that up to your attention. Uh, gosh, what do we have? A next one here. This came out in December of last year. Um, we've got Fighting from the Heavens. Let's do that. So you can see the subtitle, Tactics and Training of U.S. Army and Air Force Bomber Crews, 1941 to 45. And the author is Chris McNabb, who is a very familiar name. If you uh, collect those the Osprey Slim volumes um, that I do and I, I highlight on this channel, 
um, and other uh, casemate books. Chris McNabb is um, he's a fairly well well known uh, historian, military historian, and writer. And actually, this book reminds me, and uh, I encourage all of you if you have access to Apple TV Plus, um, I'm going to subscribe in, in about a week or so when Masters of the Air. Um, uh, the, the miniseries comes on. I'm very excited. It's from the makers of Band of Brothers and the Pacific, and it's all about the men who fought the war, World War II, in the air, the, the, the flyers, the, the pilots, and I'm so stoked for that. Anyway, what are we looking at here? During World War II, the U.S. Army Air Forces projected American military might across distances and with destructive force unimaginable just a decade previously. The B-17s and B-24s of the U.S. 8th Air Force, for example, turned much of Germany's infrastructure to twisted steel and burnt rubble between 1943 and 45. B-29 superfortresses unleashed conventional raids on Japan of even greater area destruction than that created by the atomic bomb attacks, which were also delivered by the USAAF crews. Um, beyond heavy strategic bombing, U.S. bombers performed a multitude of other tactical roles, including hunting Axis submarines, bombing enemy shipping, uh, low-level runs against precision targets, and providing heavy air support to advancing infantry and armor. While the U.S. bombers dealt out violence, however, they were also prey to a terrifying spectrum of anti-aircraft threats. And by the end of the war, 88,119 U.S. airmen had died in service. Wow. So, Fighting from the Heavens uh, prevent, presents an invaluable collection of material from U.S. wartime manuals, including doctrinal training, technical, aircraft-specific, and position-specific publications. You know what? That just reminded me of something I was thinking of showing on this channel. Uh, I recently was um, privy to, or actually... Um, uh, my my brother in law had uh, my mother when they my sister and brother in law went to visit her um, down in Alabama gave him some of my grandfather's uh, training manuals. My grandfather was in um, the U.S. Army Air Forces and flew on one of these things, um, and I, so I'm trying desperately to to begin some research into that. But I've got these these old like uh, aircraft. Uh, like, um, yeah, technical manuals that are kind of almost falling apart. But I wanted to show you on this channel just because they are a living piece of history. And I think I'll do that. Um, but this just reminds me of that and my grandfather who um, who was in the, um, the Army Air Forces. So, yay, Grandpa. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we're going to move on to the next. This book came out at the very end of November last year, and we're going to sw switch away from World War II to Vietnam, and this is Turning Points. And I, I, I get the glare from the lights. There's nothing I can really do about that one. The role of the State Department in Vietnam, 1945 to 75. Uh, we've got Ambassador Thomas Corcoran, Colonel Andrew Finlayson, and Stephen Sherman are the editors of this. Ten years after the end of the American involvement in the Vietnam War, a career Foreign Service officer, Thomas Corcoran, sat down in writing his thoughts on the history of U.S. State Department policy during America's involvement with South Vietnam. Like many Americans of his generation, he was perplexed by the failure of America to achieve its goals in South Vietnam. As an ambassador and with over 30 years of diplomatic experience, uh, beginning in 1948, when he was assigned to Hanoi and involving other postings in Southeast Asia, he brought to his analysis a long and rich personal experience with events in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. The result is a thoughtful, objective, and well-researched study that chronicles the key policy decisions made by the U.S. State Department throughout the entire period from 1945 to 75, decisions that ultimately led to the first war lost by the United States. In his extensive study, Corcoran does an excellent job of exposing many of the myths and falsehoods found in orthodox histories of U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that because I've, I kind of have, I have standard histories on Vietnam, and I've also been collecting some um, 
I don't want to say revisionist, but a different interpretation of events that has normally been put out by people such as um, yeah, the first war lost by the U.S., um, but there's other people that indicate um, it was winnable. So, um, uh, so this will be a welcome addition to my studies in Vietnam, Vietnam War. Uh, yes. So it's written by Thomas Corcoran with an introduction by Ad Andrew Finlayson, and it's edited by Stephen Sherman. And that is a casemate title. Um, we are ranging all over the place with these great books. Let's go into the next. Now, oh, this is Osprey. All right, we're going to save that for Osprey. That's also Osprey. Oh, uh, I don't know if I got these from, uh, tell you what, I'm going to, I've got a few Osprey ones that are mixed in and sometimes they, they are, um, listed with Casemate, but I typically like to group all my Osprey um new arrivals together so i'll save a few of those now we're going to go back we're going to go back to casemate and their imprints and uh we'll continue with two more casemate titles so this one's interesting this is a slim little volume but it's called i've got the pub sheet here the u.s army Combat Historian and Combat History Operations, um, World War I to the Vietnam War, by Catherine Rowe Coker and Jason Wetzel. It's a slim little little guy here. So, uh, the, the back of the dust jacket just says, you know, how the U.S. Army developed historical programs since World War I, sending combat historians into the fray to interview soldiers and collect documents for the benefit of history. So as a historian, that is also very um, intriguing. It's history about history. About history. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> um, where are we at? 12 minutes. In World War I, Major General Pershing proposed the idea of establishing a historical office within the um, American Expeditionary Forces headquarters. The War Department reorganized the general staff to include a historical branch. How many of you knew that? Um, evidence shows that soldiers acting as historians went downrange, albeit not into combat. By World War II, the situation had changed. Whether uh, SLA marshals popping out of a billet in Sibret as, a, as shells exploded on the road, forest pogues typing on a little camp desk under an apple tree, Chester Starr's terrain reconnaissance in the Mediterranean theater, or Ken Heckler's command of a four-man historical team interviewing soldiers at the Remagen Bridge and searching through secret documents. The World War II combat historians were there behind and on the front lines with a notebook in one hand and their carbine in the other, every ready, ever ready to collect battlefield information. I mean, this is a, a tale of those guys here. Oh, let's see here. SLA Marshall was Samuel, Samuel Lyman Atwood Marshall. There's a picture of him. Interesting. Let me see here. Some of the chapter titles. Uh, again, so it's World War I to the Vietnam War, so it covers all those wars and, and the, the, the men who were writing, who went downrange and, and was compiling the, the documents for history. Um, and how the program, the historical program, um, Wow, was uh, was built, but uh, there's lots of photographs in here. So uh, yeah, just an interesting take on, you know, uh, people out there as history is happening, you know, sending out those journalists and those um, those writers to to collect those documents and to document it themselves. Um, as, as a different type of book, and I'm I'm really kind of tickled to to have this one. <clears throat> Oh, this book was out, it came out in September. Like I said, I'm catching up on a lot of things here. A lot of things. Um, here's another Casemate book. Was This was back, uh, these are available now. This came out in September. This is Argentine Perspectives on the Falklands War, The Recovery and Loss of Las Malvinas by Nick Van Der Bilge. B B Vanderbilt. Um, now, this book is the first book in English 
to examine the Falklands War from the Argentine point of view. Huh? Got to get both sides, right? Um, in 1982, the United Kingdom and Argentina fought a war over an historical disagreement over the colonial ownership or rights over the Falkland Islands. Within months of the Argentinian defeat, General Edgardo, Edgardo Calvi, then the Argentine head of the Army Joint Chief of Staff, was instructed to undertake a wide-ranging and formal inquiry to investigate the performance of the Argentine Army during the Falklands. Sorry. Calvi concluded that while the Army had the motivation, it lacked the organization, equipment, training, and ability to, pose, to oppose an Army capable of operating in a variety of environments. The war exposed political, military, and public weaknesses in a period of considerable internal unrest during the seven years of the, and the next two words are capitalized, of the Dirty War. The war exposed, oh, sorry, I already read that. Several senior officers who fought in the Falklands were imprisoned for offenses committed during the Dirty War. Secrecy and political disagreements isolated the services, the service chiefs of staff from the logistic and operational planning. This book tells the story of the Falklands War from the Argentine Army perspective. Um, I don't know much about the Falklands, you know, so... Um, and of course, I have never read it from the uh, Argentinian side. How many people have? And obviously, this is the first time this uh, this is a show, uh, appearing in English. Um, got color photographs in the middle here. So just another, you know, quality um, quality produced book by Case Spain. I haven't read it yet, but uh, pretty interesting. We always put out some really eclectic titles, um, and I, I enjoy perusing. Um, and browsing because those two are two different meanings. <laughs> uh, now we go over to uh, Casemates um, Pen and Sword, uh, Pen and Sword Books, uh, an imprint. But they, well, it's not, it's their own publishing company, but Casemate kind of is their distributor. I, I've told you this many a time. Um, I think we're going back to World War II here Battle of the Cities. I don't think I have a pub sheet on this one, so I will, well, I will read the back. Battle of the Cities, Urban Warfare on the Eastern Front by Anthony Tucker Jones. Um, let's, let's dive into this. The Stalingrad Battle and the Leningrad Siege were just two of the brutal, devastating urban conflicts that marked the awful struggle between Germany and the Soviet Union during the Second World War. The cities were strategic fixed points in the sweeping advances and retreats of the opposing armies across Eastern Europe, yet no one has concentrated on these city, these city battles before or has sought to tell the story of the campaigns through the fighting that took place in and around them. That is Anthony Tucker Jones's purpose in this concise and vivid history of the urban war on the Eastern Front. Um, early in the war, during the Wehrmacht's crushing offenses of, of 1941 and 42, the Red Army was forced out of a series of key cities. Moscow was threatened, Leningrad surrounded. Then, after the climactic battle at Stalingrad, the Red Army, with increasing confidence, speed, and power, drove the Germans from the Soviet and East European capitals they had occupied. The final urban battles were fought in Germany's cities, culminating in Berlin. As he traces the course of the fighting for each city, Anthony Tucker Jones looks at the local circumstances, the opposing forces, the strategic significance, and the tactics employed. He focuses not only on the destruction and cruelty of such warfare, but on the heroism displayed on both sides and on the fate of the civilians who found themselves on the front line. Urban fighting, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's still with us uh, in wars. Um, it's that's just a sad reality, you know. Yeah, as Sherman, um, William Tecumseh Sherman has said so famously or infamously, war is hell. It is. So, urban warfare on the Eastern Front. Battle of the Cities, Anthony Tucker Jones. It looks like a very enlightening and timely, relevant read. Um, next set here. Oh, I got a couple more here. 
Oh, I think a lot of you will enjoy this. Um, and as a lot of you like old classic movie fans, I know when I showed Martine this book, she's like, I want to read that. And I was like, you, you can, it's, it's, it's a very slim book. It's the photographs are over, overly sized. So it's, there's not a lot of text here, but what a delight to have a little book here on James Stewart and war, his career in the USAAF, U.S. Army Air Forces, Air Force by Pavel Turk. Um, did many of you know that um, James Stewart, Jimmy Stewart, was, um, he fought, he, was, he flew, he was in combat? Yes, he was. Look at this, a very slim volume. Um, this is by Air World Books, actually. This is a UK book. Um, it documents his time. Uh, I'll give you a, just a brief synopsis. I won't read all of this. James Stewart was already a Hollywood star when the U.S. went to war in December of 1941. Having received an Academy Award for Best Actor in 1940 for his role in the Philadelphia Story, he had become a fami familiar face to moviegoers by the time that the Japanese struck at Pearl Harbor. By then, Jimmy had al already received his private pilot's license, so when his name was drawn by the Drafting Commission on October 29, 1940, he applied to join the U.S. Army Air Corps. He continued his pilot training, and just 12 days before he received his draft, he had obtained his commercial pilot's license. It was on January 18, 1942, that the Hollywood star was called into active duty. Um, let's see. Yeah, he flew 18 missions. He took part in raids against targets across the Third Reich, uh, including Berlin. Um and which are detailed, analyzed in detail, and supported by a fabulous collection of photographs of the aircraft Jimmy flew and the men he served with. So, a delightful little book. It's a little over 100 pages. Look at this guy. True American hero. You know, an American through and through. A patriot. Aw, there's him getting that is newlyweds. No. I, I like Jimmy Stewart. I I always have. Ah. Beautiful. Um Yeah. It's just his whole career flying in the war. Love it. This is a this is a keeper. This is a keeper. So, Pavel Turks, James Stewart at War, his career in the USAAF. Um, and then this one I'm very excited about because <clears throat> as my voice went up like that, I <laughs> that's about. Um I have other books by this author, this historian. I've listened to him on um history extra podcasts um he's very knowledgeable about he writes different about different aspects of war um and this is his most recent book it's from pen and sword military this actually came out in great britain in 2022 but um it was just recently available on this side of the pond and this is the geographies of war by jeremy black uh, I should tell you a little bit about Jer Jeremy Black. Uh, he has been described as the most prolific historical scholar of our age and has researched deeply and written extensively on history politics, including political ideas and international relations and military history. Um, and while he has specialized in British history from the 17th and 18th centuries to modern and contemporary times, uh, his range embraces antiquity, early, and medieval to modern and contemporary history and on a global scale. I mean, the guy does it all, really. But a lot of the books that I've seen kind of cover uh, different aspects of war. Um, so this book it says, A Global History of the Geography of War from Antiquity to Modern and Contemporary Conflict, illustrated and brought to life by histories of interstate war, geopolitical rivalry, hot and cold war, and terrorism. Geography is a basic element in all stages of war, including preparation, planning, onset of conflict, waging wars, assessment of results, post-conflict negotiations, analysis, and preparation for future conflict. Geography is the vital element in strategy and tactics. 
and in the spatial contexts on land, water, and space. It is central to all historical activities from human and animal transport to wind, power, coal, steam, oil, jet propulsion, atomic weaponry, and the threat of cyber conflict. This is essentially a modern geography, and not only physical, but political, social, economic, cultural, and human, with emphasis on personal experience. And mapping is included, the author's particular expertise, and accessible to specialist and general readers. Hmm. All right, let me see. Um, that was a, the dust jacket. The, the, the blurb is written kind of strangely. Um, so some of the contents of the book, um, table of contents, kind of big bucket um, uh, contents of like tactics, operations, strategy. Then he goes into leaders, generals, geographers, American wars, First World War, Second Cold War, and then from 2001 to the future. Those are some of the highlights from this. So um, this should be good. Very wide ranging. Should be a lot of different things to um, to dabble in here. So got that. And I think I'm going to continue on just for a few more books. If you will uh, indulge me and go Detroit Lions. Tonight's the night. I hope to have this video up before the kickoff begins in three hours. And how funny that I have a Matthew Stafford bobblehead. Yeah, because I love Matthew Stafford. This game against the Rams is going to be emotional. But I'm all for the Lions. Let's win a playoff game. Let's make history. All right. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to grab a few more here. Oh, I, I was like, I saw this on the list and I was like, I'd like to take a look at this. This actually um, is not out yet. So this is a new release coming, but I already have the finished copy. This is going to be um, published January 31st from Casemate. And this is 10th Army Commander, the writings of Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr., 1944 to 45. Now, to many of my... Uh, my history, um, you know, fellow historians out there, that name, you know that name. It sounds familiar. That's because Simon Bolivar Buckner uh, was a general um, on the southern side in the Confederacy. And uh, this is his son. <laughs> Are you going to believe it? Um, all right, well, let me get into it. Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr. was a major figure of the Pacific War, both for his command in Alaska and in his key role heading 10th Army during the Battle of Okinawa in the spring of 1945. Buckner was the senior U.S. officer killed by enemy fire in World War II when Japanese artillery cut him down on June 18, 1945, one month shy of his 59th birthday. The shelling ended a remarkable life. Son of a Confederate lieutenant general and governor of Kentucky, the child of democracy in the 1896 presidential election campaign, educated at West Point, myriad service as a student and instructor at various army posts and schools from 1917 to 1936, command in Alaska from 40 to 44, and ultimately of 10th Army from 44 to his death. General Buckner kept a diary covering the period from January 1st, 1944 to June 17th, 1945. The, the day before he was killed, um, which has never been fully published until now. That's why I'm so excited for this. Um, Buckner made notes every day, often in great detail. His chief of staff thought Buckner wanted to write a memoir after the war, but the papers were, were scattered after his death. In addition to the Okinawa material, Buckner's diaries discuss his departure from Alaska and service in Hawaii as 10th Army commander. Topics include his daily life in wartime Hawaii, troop training, comments on war events, gossip, notes on his travels to Guam and the Philippines, and his role in the Smith versus Smith controversy after the Battle of Saipan. The diary text is augmented by letters from General Buckner to his wife, Adele, during March to June 1945, and a letter from the 10th Army Chief of Staff to Adele detailing Buckner's death. 10th Army Commander is an important account from a too long silent voice among Pacific War leaders. That is for sure. Um, I cannot wait to read this. Some of the diary entries in here. Um, but yeah, 
And you're probably wondering the timing, like how could a son of a lieutenant general in the Civil War be alive during World War II, right? Because you'd think he would have been ancient. But well, so the story is, I mean, Simon Bolivar Buckner, <laughs> I think he got himself a really young wife. Um, like this is his father in 1861, okay? But I think he had, um, Junior came along when he was probably in his 80s or 90s, I don't know. <laughs> and that's that's why, that's why the timing works out for that. Um, but anyway, yes, looking forward to 10th Army Commander. Coming out at the end of this month, brand new release from Casemate. Yay. Um, let's see here. Ooh, this one's kind of heavy. Heavy. All right, this one is came out back in October, but um, we've got the defeat of the damned, the destruction of the Dirlwanger Brigade in the Battle of, of Ip Ip Ipolisag, December 1944. Battles I've never heard of in World War II. One of the most notorious yet least understood body of troops that fought for the Third Reich during World War II was the infamous Sonder Reinheit Dirl Wanger, or the Dirl Dirlwanger Special Unit, formed initially as a company sized formation in June 1940 from convicted poachers. It served under the command of SS Obersturmfuhrer Obersturm Oskar Dirlwanger one of the most infamous criminals in military history. First used to guard the Jewish ghetto in Lublin and support security operations carried out in occupied Poland by SS and police forces, the unit was soon transferred to Belarus to combat the increasingly active Soviet partisan movement. After assisting in putting down the Warsaw Uprising during August-September of 1944, by November of that year, it had been enlarged and retitled as the two- SS Sturm Brigade Daryl Wanger. One month later, it fought one of its most controversial actions near the town of Ipolisag, Hungary, now known by its Slovak name of Shahi, uh, between 13th and 18th December 1944. As a result of its overly hasty and haphazard deployment, lack of heavy armament, and a confusing chain of command, it was virtually destroyed by two Soviet mechanized corps. Um... So then, uh, okay, well, there's a lot going on in this book. Consequently, the Wehrmacht leadership blamed Daryl Wanger and the performance of his troops for the encirclement of the Hungarian capital of Budapest during late December 1944 that led to the annihilation of its garrison two months later. The brigade's defeat at Polisag also led to its compulsory removal from the front lines by General der Panzer, Panzer Troop Hermann Balk and its eventual shipment to a rest area where it would be completely rebuilt, so thorough was its destruction. Despite its lackluster performance, the brigade was recovered, uh, when, sorry, the brigade was rebuilt once again and sent to East Prussia in February 1945, but never recovered from the thrashing it received at the hands of the Sixth Guards Army in December. So a little, uh, little known battle. Um, I have never heard of it, but... Um, a lot of times, you know, Casemate will publish very in-depth, detailed, analytical um, military histories. So, um, wow. Lots of Nazis in this one. So, I just have to dip in and out of this one. But uh, the, defeat, the Defeat of the Damned by Douglas E. Nash Sr. Did I say that? Sorry, I did not give the... Okay, Douglas E. Nash Sr. So... This is brand new. came out in October. Um, check it out. Oh, I wanted to show this one, too. I thought I had already. Um, this is a different kind of book, and I don't have a pub sheet for it. I think this came out at the end of... It came out at the end of last year. Yeah. This is on Warrior's Wings, so we're going to move away from Nazis for a minute. <laughs> on Warrior's Wings, Army Vietnam War Helicopters and the Native Americans They Were Named to Honor by David Napoliello. 
So that's interesting. And, you know, some people maybe might be like, that's the ultimate insult. Um, I don't know. It's, uh, but they did name helicopters after Native Americans, you know, to, I guess, well, to honor their warrior spirit, even though we're, we're the ones that defeated them. But, you know, take it for what it is. Um, on Warrior's Wings is the culmination of eight years of research, interviews, and study of the engineering evolution of rotary wing aircraft. Okay, so this is just more than that. Um, this is an in-depth, this is very technical. I mean, they go into technical detail on each of these uh, air, uh, aircraft, but then they also combine it with a bit of history about the name um, of, of, you know, uh, the, the the tribe or the chief of the um, the name that they would give to it. So they go into the actual technical details of how it was built, and then they will go into uh, the history of, like, say, for Mojave, it'll talk about the people of the river uh, and then talk about the Mojave Indians. So anyway, um, so it talks about the en engineering evolution to focus <laughs> engineering evolution of these uh, rotary wing aircraft um, from the army's experimentation with them beginning in the 1920s and the eventual growth of their numbers army-wide so pervasive was the helicopter in the second indochina war that besides being called the vietnam war it is frequently frequently referred to as america's helicopter war where in 11,827 unique tail number u.s helicopters were flown in country during the war. In the 1950s, the Army began honoring great Native American tribes and prominent warrior chiefs by naming each helicopter after one of them. Um, during his tenure as Director of Army Aviation, Major General Hamilton Howes began the practice when he decided that the H-13, fielded in 1948, would bear the name Sioux. He envisioned the helicopter, specifically the H-13, as a fast, mobile, stealthy machine on the battlefield, using terrain and vegetation to an advantage similar to the warrior tribes. Eleven Native American-named helicopters saw combat in Vietnam. This volume faithfully traces the operational requirements for each and its advancement through the development and fielding process. Um... It further captures the many diverse m missions each... Um, and their crews performed during the in-country in yeah, in country lifetime of that particular fleet of helicopters. Um, let's see here. So important to each of these 11 aircraft um, that they are going to highlight in here. Is it just the 11? Yes. So, okay. So, um... Mm -hmm. Important to each of these 11 aircraft is the distinguished history and heritage of the tribe or chief, the honored namesake of the helicopter. Native Americans have fought alongside settlers, colonists, and Americans since before the American Revolution, almost always in percentages larger than their proportion of the population, a tradition that continues today. While not always on the side of the settlers and colonists, their demonstrated warrior skills, determination, devotion to family, tribe, home, an ethos engendered an abiding respect among their fellow combatants and adversaries. The heritage and contributions of the nine tribes and two tribal chiefs honored by these aircraft are recounted in each story. So that's what I find very interesting. Obviously, I am not a pilot, so I'm not, you know, I'm going to have to kind of gloss over the more technical details, but um, I really am interested to learn how each of these were named, why they were named, and then just read the, you know, their, their history that they kind of include. You know, it's just another uh, another facet to military history. You, you won't, you didn't, know, you don't even consider. You know, so uh, on Warrior's Wings by David Napoliello. Um, uh, this book is a the Global Collective Publishers is the uh, the publisher on that. So from the, okay, I think I'm gonna pause right here, guys. I still have a ton more books to show you, but I will make another video and release that in a couple weeks. Um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, snapshot of some of the the new and uh, in the case of this book coming out at the end of the month. Very excited. Uh, I get a sneak peek first. Um, let me know if you're interested in a follow up on this at all. I mean, it's just a diary, right? But it's it's fascinating to know that we had a 
um, you know, a, the son of a Civil War general who gave his life in World War II. And uh, it's just, it's good stuff. And that comes out at the end of the month from Casemate. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining me here on the History Self, History Shelf. Stay warm out there. I'm going to drink some water and uh, counting down to the big game. So hope you're all doing well. Take care and see you back here. Bye.